today for this gift of breath and life. We give you thanks for this church, this community gathered here to worship. We give you thanks for your creation, the changing seasons, falling leaves. We give you thanks. For your mercy, for your forgiveness, for your love, we give you thanks. In our weakness, we thank you for your power is made evident. In our failures, we thank you, for your grace is sufficient. Even in the trials, through the struggles and pain, as you form us into who you want us to be, turning our mess into your message. Today and every day, we give you thanks. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome in to Echo Community Church. Would you guys stay with me as we get started with our call to worship this morning? It says, when the sun's shining down and when the road is marked with suffering and pain, we say with Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name.
seated. Good morning. I hope you're all staying warm. It's cold out there, but um, I would just like to, at this time, call the ushers forward, and um, we will pray together, and then um, there's a few announcements this morning, but the prayer family of the week is Julia, Julia Heldman. So she's asked for prayer for a continuation of the joy and peace of our gathering together in Jesus' love, which is be very happy to pray for that. It's been a huge blessing, and the Lord has been very good to us. So let's let's uh, let's lift her up and and pray. Father, uh, you are the High King of Heaven. Uh, you have won the victory through 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 Jesus' death. Thank you that you have defeated sin and death, and that you have given us life through Jesus. Teach us to honor you as, as King and Lord. You created all things, and it, and it 
obeys your word. And Lord, cause us to obey your word as well and to worship you together this morning as we, even as we take offering, would you bless it and multiply it and receive it with uh, gladness from our hearts. And, and just as we, as we continue to sing together and listen to the preaching of the word, would we worship you with our whole heart? You are worthy. And um, we thank you for the blessing that you have poured out on this church, and we ask that you would continue to bless with joy and peace and love as we worship together and live together in community and serve you side by side and just give unity, Lord. And where there's a fence, may we, co- your word says love covers over a multitude of evils. May we be gracious to each other and and just love each other well, and give us discernment on how to love well. What does that mean in each circumstance? And just ask for your blessing on Julia, that you would continue to strengthen her hands to serve you in the many different ways that she serves. And thank you for the joy that we see and um, the reflection of you in her, Jesus. And continue to bless, and her family, extended family as well, and her children, um, pour out your love in their hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there are quite a few uh, there are quite a few Christmas related announcements this morning. It must be coming. And uh, the first is that is a new one. So December tenth, um, Saturday morning, December tenth, from nine thirty to twelve, there will be a children's Christmas party. So this is for kids from ages three to twelve. So um, they, there's a sign up on our website if they're interested in coming, and um, this may be a good opportunity, parents, to get off to do some Christmas shopping or something and drop your kids for the Christmas party, and so double blessing there. Uh, sign up on the website. It's limited to 50 kids, so first come, first serve for that. Uh, the, the YCC Christmas program is going to be on December 18th which is a Sunday morning. It's a children's program, but there's also adults involved, and there will be a Christmas choir. So adults, kids, um, if you're interested in joining the Christmas choir, sign up for that in the foyer. Um, talk to Ro or Sam. They're, in char- they're overseeing the program, and so we're looking forward to that. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. The first practice is next Sunday at noon. Also, the Yuletide train, many people signed up for that. It's full. There's no more space. But if you signed up and you don't think you're going to be able to make it, go ahead and let us know so we can open up space for someone else to to jump in on that. And so you could just cross your name off the sign-up sheet, or I don't even know if it's still out, so you may have to just come talk to one of us. Or You have the blue Get Connected cards. You could always turn one of those in with. Um, We're not going to be able to make it, and we'll make room for someone else. Um, Also, as you're leaving today, ladies, for the women's retreat, if you um, haven't signed up for that, you can sign up in the foyer on your way out. It's at Cannon Beach, February 24th to 26th. Um, You're encouraged to get your deposits in by December 4th. So make sure you get your deposits in by December 4th. It looks, sounds like it's going to be a wonderful time. So sign up for that on your way out. And the last thing But not least is the MBF celebration, the Moving by Faith celebration is also December 4th at 4 p.m. And so um, if you are not familiar with what our Moving by Faith campaign is, it was a fundraising campaign for the new building project that went for several years. And this is just a celebration of what it was and how the Lord blessed and provided and used it. And it's we're just looking forward to a, a joyful um, hearing, hearing testimonies and um, praising the Lord for what he has done and provided through that. So we want as many people to be there as possible, just as the Lord has been using everyone together to accomplish this. And so 4 p.m. December 4th, sign up um, for the event so we know what to count on, and especially if you need child care so Tandy knows how to plan for, for child care. Um, That's also in the foyer. So, Moving by Faith Celebration, December 4th at 4 p.m. All right, with that, I'm going to... Yes, Sandra. Christmas cards at the the missions table out there. 
Okay, if you have Christmas cards for missionaries still, bring them by next Sunday so we can get them sent off. There's still a few bundles out there, so you can see Sandra or, or Kenna at the table afterwards to get a bundle of Christmas cards to fill out to bless our missionaries. All right, um, you're dismissed to fellowship time. Greet a neighbor, and we'll be back here in a few minutes. First John. <laughs> We're going to be in First John chapter 4 today. I'm thankful for Bryce, and he, he does the announcements so well. Um, I want to add one to it, um, and that is right after the service today, after this service, but before second service, we don't have um, our expositors Bible class because we have a membership meeting, and uh, in here to to uh, really we're just covering the budget for 2023. So you should have received that in your in your mailbox or your email box over the last couple of weeks. So we'll be getting together to to um, vote on that, and we just invite all of you to be here. And even if you're not a member, you're more than welcome to sit in on that. So. Um, and also, speaking of members, our newest members um, are Rick and Christy Dunning. You may have seen their picture up there. I don't know if they're in the service today or not. Can't see very well, but uh, we want to wel- welcome them. There we go. So, so and uh, let's see. Anything else? Oh, yeah, I wanted to address one serious matter right before we jump into our text. And um, that is for those of you who find it necessary to send to me pictures of the game that you've harvested this hunting season. Um, It's not appreciated. It brings up in me quite a bit of envy and doesn't put me in a worshipful mood on a Sunday morning. No, I'm joking. It's, it is, it makes me happy to see how well you've done. Kind of. I will get out hunting for the first time this next week for, for a few days. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, let's pray as we turn. Lord, we love you. We thank you for um, the way that you've built your church. And uh, we are here this morning to bring your name glory through our time together, through our song, through our fellowship, through the time we have now in your word. And may your word grow us, change us more into the image of Jesus. We love you. And uh, we pray this in his name. Amen. First John chapter 4, we'll read our text in just a moment, but there are a lot of things in our world today that have value and that we put value to, uh, great value, diamonds, gold, memorabilia, these kinds of things, many things with, with value. And because we live in the world that we live in, there are, there are many people that have made quite a career out of counterfeiting our valuables. And because of this, there is whole industry set up to try to seek out and test the, the, the authenticity of certain memorabilia, gold, jewelry, different items. Test these things so that they would be proven not to be counterfeit, to be the genuine article. So, for example, and I don't know this very well, but this is just from my study, if you look at gold, you can take gold, and if you want to find it's real, you can go through a whole bunch of tests. You can, you can uh, put it under a magnifying glass. You can put it on your, your hand and see if it turns your skin a different color. You can drop it in water to see if it sinks, those kinds of things. Same thing with diamonds, right? Diamonds, there's all kinds of different tests. You can put it under a magnifying glass, or you can scratch something to see if it would scratch it, or you can put it under a black light or fog it up and see how clear it is, all these different things. Um, And it's important to do those things because you want to be able to see how authentic something truly is. And... As we look at this text today, um, we see that there are some ways to test an authentic faith. And what could be more valuable than an authentic relationship with the Lord Jesus? But as John points out to us, there are many that would offer a counterfeit faith, a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit Jesus. And so he does some things in our text today to help his true children to discern the real from the fake, the truth from the error, the, the, the true value from that which is counterfeited. So let's read um, in Mark, or sorry, 
1 John chapter 4, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 6. You can follow along. He uses his regular greeting to these brothers and sisters, the warm greeting of beloved. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What John does here is he understands that there's a difference between a true believer and a counterfeit believer, a true gospel and a false gospel. And so he provides some tests for us to be able to discern the difference. We're going to look at those tests in just a moment, but I want to begin by just asking you this question, because this is the, kind of the big question of this passage is, who is it that you are listening to? Who is it that I am listening to? Who has influence in my life and in your life? You know, the big idea of this passage is is as children of God, as Christians, we have an ability to hear, to listen, to discern the voice of God through the glory and the beauty of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We, We truly can't understand the Bible the scriptures without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is imperative that we as followers of Christ know who we are listening to because we have this glorious gift of the indwelling of the Spirit. And this is important because in John's day, there was this false belief system called Gnosticism. We've talked about this already. I won't spend much time, but the Gnostics were invading the church at this time and they were giving a false gospel. They were telling these genuine believers in Jesus that in order to be a genuine believer in Jesus, it wasn't just faith in Jesus. You had to have some greater understanding, a deeper knowledge, which is what Gnostic means, um, knowledge. And so that's what they did here. These, These Gnostics, they believed at the core that anything physical was evil. And that's important. They believe anything that was physical is evil. And because of that belief, that meant that Jesus could not have been, according to their belief system, a real human being. Because real flesh and blood is evil. And so if Jesus was truly flesh and blood, then he couldn't truly be divine. And that was a heresy um, of the Gnostics. And so for them, it was really important that they would try to deceive people to believe that Jesus wasn't just um, um, deity. He was only deity and he wasn't of the flesh. And so for this, we get to see that there's, there's a few different tests that he gives. These two different tests, we're not going to get to them just yet. Let's talk about this sense of spirits. He talks about the spirits, and it's important here because when he says test the spirits to see if they are from God, he's directing our minds as well as the minds of the readers and the believers of that day to the world of the supernatural, to the spiritual world. There is a driving force behind the gospel that is being preached to them as well as to us. And if it was just of the natural world, John would be telling us that we should just really, um, we can test the person who's speaking. We can test the message of these false teachers. But that's not what he's saying. He's calling our focus not onto the individual, but the spirit that is driving the individual, that which is behind the, the natural, the physical things. And he says this because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. And these false prophets are driven by an evil spirit. 
the Antichrist. So test number one, what is the confession? We get this from verses two and three, and this is it. Test number one is what is their confession? What is their confession? Look there again, verse two, it says, by this you know the spirit of God, that every spirit confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world. It seems like a pretty simple test, doesn't it? Every spirit that confesses Jesus is the Messiah, um, then that spirit is from God. And every spirit that does not confess it is not of God. And at a first reading, in just kind of a simple glance, it might, <coughs> you might think, oh, that's pretty straightforward. But as you kind of dig in a little bit deeper, one important thing to understand is that word confess in its original language and in its original tense. It is that of a continual confession. It's not a one-time confession of faith. It is a continual confession, a continuing of confessing that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus came in the flesh. It's more than just mere words. It's not just to say it once and then to believe it. It is a statement that must be backed up by a convictional belief that is ongoing, that says that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was Lord, he is Lord, and he is now my Lord, submitting ourselves to his his, his ultimate rule in our life. And we see, and this is the struggle, we see in the Gospels um, upon meeting Jesus, even the demons, right? The demons confessed and acknowledged that Jesus was the son of God come in the flesh. But there obviously wasn't any submission to him as Lord. And in Matthew chapter seven, as a matter of fact, would you just turn there? Um, keep your finger in First John, but go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter seven. We'll, we'll hit in this chapter twice, so it's worth turning there. I'll give you just a second. Okay. It says this, verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Here in this verse, he, he's saying that uh, confession is that Jesus must come in the flesh. And, and this, this truth of Christ's humanity is what sets Christianity apart from every other faith, every other world religion that might be out here, that Jesus is fully God and is fully human. If you want the fun theological word, it's the hypostatic union. Fun word, right? Hypostatic union. That means that God is, or Jesus is fully human and he is fully God. He is one person but has two natures. It's hard for our minds to understand that. But without that, without that understanding, there's no difference between Christianity and so many other religions. And most importantly, the scriptures don't make sense. They contradict themselves if that truth is not real. And yet, that's what the Gnostics wanted people to believe. I think in our day today, I don't think we have such a hard time thinking about Jesus being in the flesh because we have the historical records of Christ in our world today, I think this bigger struggle is not with him being human, but him being God. In 1 John, um, he lays this out. Actually, in John's gospel, you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 1, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word that he is talking about here, that Word is Jesus. And so we can say that Jesus was present at the very beginning. He was present. But then if you go to verse 14 of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, fully God, put on flesh, lived among his creation. And, and while he walked this earth, our Lord and our Savior was absolutely perfect without sin. Doesn't mean that he could not sin. Um, he just did not sin. He was 
experiencing all of the same consequences of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. For example, he experienced pain. He experienced exhaustion. He experienced hunger. He experienced temptation, frustration, sadness, happiness, empathy, sympathy. But never once in his full humanity did he sin. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So back here, jump back to 1 John. Keep your finger in Matthew 7, though. Coming back to 1 John, um, those who acknowledge with their mouths and believe in their hearts that Jesus is Lord is a true follower of Christ. They understand this. And we've talked a lot about this in this book of 1 John. What's great about 1 John is he puts such um, a practical emphasis on the theological depth of our faith. There, is, there, there can't be a d- dissection between what we think and believe and how we live our life. So he talks about walking in the light, not walking in the darkness. He talks about keeping the Lord's commands, specifically loving God first and foremost and loving others. He's talked about loving God instead of loving the world. He's talked about bi- abiding in God rather than abiding in the world. He's talked about practicing righteousness versus practicing lawlessness. He's talked about loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, truly loving. I really liked how Bryce prayed before the service when he prayed, Lord, help us to know how to love, how to discern what love looks like in this situation. He also talks about how how we are to love those who are not believers in the faith. So, test number one, if you want to know if someone is who they say they are, um, then you have to run their life along with their words through that standard. It's not someone that would live a perfect life and always have a perfect answer. That doesn't happen. That's only Christ. But it is a person that is professing that Jesus came in the flesh, that he is God, he, is ma- he was man, and also seeing someone that has this conviction, this desire to grow, this ongoing confession through the things in which they speak, act, and believe. So we're going to come back to verse 4. We're actually going to hopscotch here to verses 5 and 6 for the second test here. The second test, not just confess, what is their confession? Do they confess Christ? But test number two is who are they listening to? Who are they listening to? Let's read verses five and six. It says again, they are, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of, of error. So a few weeks back, we defined the, the belief system, or we define the word, the word world, because you hear that a lot. We want to be in the world, but not of the world. And what does scripture mean when it talks about the world? Well, what scripture means and what John means here is he's talking about this invisible, supernatural systems of beliefs that are against God, against the work of Christ. It's an invisible set of supernatural beliefs or systems that are against the work of God, against the work of Christ. And so he sets us up, and we know that Satan has dominion, at least limited dominion, right now. Um, and those who carry the spirit of the Antichrist find themselves as citizens of the world. And that's what drives their, their speech, it drives their actions. So these teachers, back in the day that this was written, their teaching about Jesus was shaped, not just about Jesus, it was shaped about worldly religion, worldly philosophy. They would take a little bit of the way the world is, and back in those times it was higher thought, it was greater thinking, it was greater consciousness. 
Um, Today, it might be everyone's spiritual, everyone's religious, everyone has their own truth. We live, some say, not even in a in a, in a post-Christian era, post-truth era, where people don't even believe in truth anymore, which is an impossibility. You can't even make that statement and not believe in truth. If you say that there is no truth, that's a statement of truth. So it breaks down. But with this, whoever listens to God, he says, listens to us, or whoever knows God listens to us. When John says that, he's talking about the apostles. He's talking about the, the writers of the New Testament those that are the early church leaders because they're drawing their truth from Jesus and abiding in a relationship with Christ. And I just want to pause. I'm stepping outside of this just for a moment. And, you know, we have some really hot topics in our culture today. And some of those hot topics, I'll just say, let's just talk about the gender topic for a moment. Um, Regardless of um, just that topic as, as a whole, what we need to understand about the, the gender issue and the, the, really the world system behind the gender issue is that it's got this whole group of people in this world that tries to define their identity by their gender. This also can be true related to sexuality, that people are defined by their sexual orientation, or people can be defined by whatever sect they might place themselves in. That system of thought, that amalgamation of of thought is not true. It's not true from scripture and the reason it's not true is because you are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. That's what scripture teaches. That's what John is, we've already covered that here in 1 John. There are children of God and there are children of the devil. So you either identify as a kingdom believer, as someone that is a, a forgiven sinner and being forgiven sinner of the Lord Jesus Christ or not. You're not defined by how you feel about your gender or how you feel about your sexuality or how you feel about this or how you feel about that. It's a much more worldly system that tries to get people to think, well, I am how I feel gender-wise, sexuality-wise, and those kinds of things. It's, it's a worldly system. And as Christians, we have to be guarded because he tells us here, we need to be focused on the truth, the truth of Christ, and that your identity is either in the finished work of Christ or it's in the pretty smelling in this world work of the devil. Those are the two places. Are you identified with the work of Christ and you're a forgiven sinner or are you something else? It's a worldly system. And let me just tell you, we as followers of Christ, he says, cannot grow weary when the world rejects our message. This is one of the reasons why so many Christians are walking away from the faith is because they try to stand for the truth and they get weary of standing from the truth and they start to buy into worldly systems. And there's so many worldly systems. I just used that one particular example. We have to be guarded. We have to be guarded because we have the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit and his message is not accepted by the world systems that we live in. So, so this test, well, sometimes it can be easy to run. It can also be a difficult thing. And it's a difficult thing when it comes to leaders in the church specifically. Listen to what Jesus says if you're still in Matthew. Matthew chapter 7 again, verse 15. He says this, He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He's saying that teachers, false teachers, they can be charming, they can be likable, and in the midst of that charming likability, they also can be manipulative and infectious, carcinogenic. But when the time comes for their fruit to sprout, Jesus says, you're going to recognize them by their fruits. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So important in the, in the Christian faith to stay guarded against. And one of the ways in which we feel like this is important and, and is the reason we preach the way that we preach as a church, we have an expositive approach. Um, we go through the scriptures, 
We let the scriptures dictate the direction of, of where we're at as a church body. And so some would say, well, why don't we do more topical stuff? And there's not anything wrong with a topical message in, in its core, but if that's the only diet of the word that you get, then you're looking for things just to scratch the needs in your life when the living word of God always addresses the deeper needs of the heart. So that's kind of our focus and one of the ways we guard against here, against um, getting sucked into worldly systems because there's a lot of things that maybe we'd like to talk about, but we are just looking at the surface and the word of God gets beneath the surface. So if we look back at these two tests, there's, there's two tests here. Who, who, are, who are they listening to? Who, who are these people listening to that are trying to have influence? What is their confession? And then what is driving their confession? Who, who and what are they listening to? What is their confession and who or what are they li- listening to? So let's jump back now to verse 4 of 1 John chapter 4. This is the closing kind of encouragement for us. Uh, this is the motivation for us as followers of Christ to keep fighting forward. Uh, those who are trying to pull us away um, have, have taken the truth about Jesus and they've twisted it, they've thrown it in their blender to try to fit their own feelings. But for us, what we can know in this weary life that we can live is that God is greater. Our Heavenly Father is greater than anything that this world can throw at you. Any temptation that we could believe, God is greater than those temptations. Any attack that you might face because of your beliefs, God is greater. Any trial that comes your way, anything that might knock you to the ground, causing you to question God in that moment, he is greater. The fear that can come when we look around at this world, and I think a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people that have been wrestling with some fear. If you didn't know, we just had some midterm elections and that causes people to think certain ways. What we need to know is that God is greater. And that fear that can come because of a world that's crumbling, God is greater. He is greater. He's greater than the lies. He's greater than even the influencers in this world that we have. He is greater than the winds of change. He is greater than this world and the things in this world. And if you remember anything today, remember this. Romans 8, 11. Good one to memorize. Not that I would ever, well, I'm not going to say that. This is a good one to memorize. The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you and me is greater than he who is in the world. And then in verse 6 of chapter 4, 1 John, he says, By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So where does that leave us? Who are you listening to? So we look to apply this today. There's just three questions I'd ask. What is, what is your confession? What is your confession of the faith? Do you confess that Jesus is God come in the flesh, fully God and fully man? And is that confession just a one-time confession or is that a lifelong lifestyle confession? What drives that confession? What drives it? And then who are you listening to? Who am I listening to? It's concerning because there are so many messages that come to us today. Some of us have our our favorite channels that we might watch. All of the youths of these days have their influencers that they follow on social media. There are so many people out there that have influence and have a say, have a voice in our lives. And, and I see this too, especially my, my youngest daughter will ask me oftentimes as she sees someone that she likes because she's seen them on a TV show or on social media and she'll say, Dad, are they a Christian? And, and it's like, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could keep up with all that stuff. I can't keep up with all that stuff. Um, But then she'll say, well, they said they were a Christian, so they must be, right? Well, that's hard. You know, that's just not a quick answered question. But it's a good question, 
And it's a question that not just 12-year-olds should be asking, it's a question that we should ask. But my concern is that we have people in our lives, on media, in different places, that have a voice and that have a message and that are very good at speaking and they might even align with our particular persuasions. And then they'll throw out that they are a Christian or they're a follower of God. And then we can just immediately glob on to that little confession of faith and then adopt their worldly systems of thought. And that's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. And we have to be guarded, brothers and sisters, against those kinds of systems. And we live in a complicated world, but he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And we certainly are to be people that listen first and foremost to the spirit of God living in us and allowing his voice to speak louder and louder. And I I do believe that if, if the apostle Paul was here and teaching as he went in Timothy, he talks about searing um, the spirit in our life and the Holy Spirit becomes quieter and quieter because our ears and our eyes and our hearts are too open to the world around us. So, So let me just offer up this warning. Your truth may not be God's truth. Too many people find their theology in their favorite voices in this culture Be guarded against that. Let's pray. Father, we're just thankful for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Father, I confess how easy it is today in the busyness and the movement of our society and how we're all oftentimes sucked into entertainment and that we can uncheck our minds and allow the the voices and the influencers of this day to have a say. Maybe we don't even recognize it. But Lord, help us to discern not so much the people that we listen to, but the spirit or the system behind those people's messages. And Lord, help us to be those that are first and foremost and always gripped by our walk with you. That you, Lord Jesus, would be the king of our hearts, that we would profess you as Lord and as Savior. We thank you and we love you. And this we pray in Christ's name, amen. I invite you to stand just with a strong reminder to, as you take the message here of the gospel, I just remind you, do that with with great resolve. Go into this world with peace, and have courage, strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and certainly share the gospel in word and in deed. Love and serve our Lord Jesus Christ, not in your own power, but in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And may the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the
Thank you guys for coming. Uh, now's the time we have our business meeting in between. So uh, we'd love to have you guys there. Everyone's invited. Um, and we will see you guys. It, it's going to be in the sanctuary, I believe. So uh, feel free to stick around. And we will see you next week as well. Thank you so much for coming.